live. Are you watching your live countdown? You're live. All right. <laughs> All right. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome Mrs. Nina Morrison here with our All County performers. To welcome students. They have a little uh, presentation this evening. All right, so we're going to start with uh, a song actually from our spring concert last year. We're going to be singing Cover Me in Sunshine. is one from our spring concert that's coming up in June, and it is called Shine. Oh, 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 oh. Feel it. 
great job, everybody. Hi. All right, you're good? Great. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to call to order a regular meeting of the Board of Education of the Goshen Central School District, being held on Monday, April 8, 2024, at 6.30 p.m. in the District Administration Building and live streamed on YouTube. There will be a proposed executive session subject to board approval from 6.30 to approximately 7 p.m. with the intent of the Board of Education to reconvene the business portion of the meeting directly following that. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I need a motion to move to an executive session. John? Scott? Be resolved, the Board of Education will enter into executive session with the intent to reconvene the business portion of the meeting and discussions related to the employment history of a particular person or persons. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We'll be back shortly. Thank you.
go here. Right, here I need a motion to reconvene the meeting. John. So I have a couple things to bring up. So first, um, the senior class has named the 2024 top six students, which are Judah Gordon, Thomas Tedeschi, Grant Moore, Michael Holst, Kia Aya Gazelle, and Nora Stunton. So congratulations to those students. And then next, the Goshen High School National Honor Society is presenting its community outreach project called Socks for Souls, which is supporting a mental health nonprofit organization called Sean's Dream. And they are in need of children's adults' underwear and socks and toiletries by April 20th, 2024. So donations would be greatly appreciated. And then to conclude, we had over 50 students from CJ Hooker and the high school who were recognized at the Soaring Truth Awards on March 8th at SUNY Orange. And SUNY Orange recognizes the accomplishments of these deserving students in grades 6 through 12, and we're very proud of them. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And where can people drop off donations or find out more information? Um, the high school. So, and if you go to the website, like, they should, it's like a certain day, and then you could just bring all the things that you need during that day, and all the box, so. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Right, moving on to our next reserve business, our legislative update. Oxbow, Mr. John Sullivan. Thank you. Uh, last meeting, I had discussed um, the last Oxbow meeting. There were several people attended from various mental health offices in the county. Um, I had a few more packets tonight and added to more time online. The um, resources that were provided to us at that meeting, um, I would say uh, the takeaway from that meeting. The first page you have here with the list of uh, services, um, that one and the, with this, the fourth page, the poster is says hope starts here down for one one. They couldn't stress enough that this should be everywhere. And, uh, you know, like a question for Dr. Coates, I assume there's a lot in the district, but um, it really was uh, amazing to me how many programs are available from a mental health standpoint and how relatively, I don't want to say easy, but abundant they are for you to secure, especially for kids who are, uh, who are having a hard time. Obviously, it's, a, you know, it's an epidemic in our world today, and uh, something that lots of people are struggling with. So I just wanted to make sure I got the information out and the resources that are available um, should anybody need it. So other than that, there was a OSPA meeting uh, this past week that unfortunately I was unable to attend. Um, was our town, but it was focusing on the, uh, the legal nature of AI in the district. And um, once I get the summary of that, maybe I'll follow up to report on that next time. So, thanks so much. Fantastic. Thank you very much. All right, moving on. Are there any other board member committee reports? Any updates anybody would like to share? Okay, not at this time. Policy update. Did everybody have a chance to read through the policies? Mm -hmm. All right, fantastic. So we're not going to spend too much time on that. The policies that the board has read over for the first reading tonight are corporal punishment, policy number 5300.55, student voter registration and pre registration, number 5605, purchasing authority, number 6710. Use of surveillance cameras on school property, number 8210.1. Rights of employees to express breast milk in the workplace, number 9520.6. Charging school meals and prohibition against shaming, number 8505.
free and reduced price meal services, number 8520. And later on in the evening, there is an item on our agenda to approve a few policies. Those policies will be recruiting and hiring, number 9240, and also conditional appointment and emergency conditional appointment, student safety, number 9260. Those will be approved in the evening. All right, next on the agenda is our superintendent's report. Thank you, sir. So I wanted to address just briefly, I've been working on both the written and verbal questions that came up at our roundtable on the 18th. My intent was to try to finish everything this past Friday, but got derailed somewhat when the earthquake happened, spent the rest of the day in the buildings. So I've been working with our administrators to make sure that all the questions are addressed and addressed properly. I will get those out to the board first. That will be before the end of this week. I'm hopeful by midweek and then we'll make sure they get distributed to the proper parties, hopefully before the end of this week. I also wanted to share with the board, in your packet tonight uh, is an annual survey that the New York State Education Department is required to do uh, through the IDEA and ultimately through the New York State Education Department regarding parent satisfaction, if you will, in relation to uh, special education services offered within every school district. Each year they pick one indicator that they ask school districts to take part in the survey and they give a benchmark number of surveys that they look for you to distribute to your population based on the number of classified families, I'm sorry, classified students that you have within your school district. This year we were selected for Indicator 8, and it was SUNY Potsdam Institute for Applied Research who cooperated with our school district to monitor the survey for this year. As you can see, Indicator 8 touches on a wide variety of data in terms of collaboration with families, input from teachers and administrators, and uh, again, parent satisfaction. These uh, families were selected randomly using random.org on who was going to receive the surveys and families have an opportunity to return the survey both or either in paper or online. Our target sample size for this year was 81 families. We actually had 100 surveys that were returned. The breakdown in terms of the age group on what was returned um, CPSE, which would have been uh, ages three through five was 21 families. Ages 6 through 11 was 42 families. Ages 12 to 13 were seven families. And then 14 through 21 were 29 families. And then we had one response that did not indicate an age bracket. The state of New York considers, uh, if you look at the response brackets, strongly agree or very strongly agree uh, a positive response rate. And I'm pleased to report, based on the hard work of our teachers, our support staff, and our administrators, that this survey indicated a 97% positive response rate. So I want to make sure that we share this with the board. And again, I very much want to publicly thank our teachers, our support staff, and our administrators for everything that they do to make sure that we continue to do our best to address and survey, uh, address and uh, work hard with all the families <laughs> as reflected in the survey for our families with disabilities. Going to turn to the heavy lift now for the evening for budget. So, um, as was asked by the Board of Education last week, our last meeting rather, Mrs. Lamran and I have gone back, have presented and prepared for the board tonight several different options on how to balance the budget for this week. Mrs. Lamran and I are going to partner on this and go through what we have ready for the board tonight. So, if you can give us a minute to just shift around, we will get started. on your comments from the last meeting and we'll just go through each of these with you. This is 
just a repeat of the last few meetings, but I like to keep track of the different presentations that we've done. We're now on budget presentation number four. We also have uh, scheduled the board to adopt the budget on April 22nd, and that's in order for us to file the property tax report card on time. The due date for that is on April 29th. The public budget hearing will be May 7th before the board meeting. And then the annual budget vote is here in central office on Tuesday, May 21st. Here is our historical tax levy. Just to, again, you probably saw this slide in the last presentation. Over the past 10 years, our average is 2.39%. We've had some increases over the years, and we've had some zero rates. And last or this current year, we have a 1% increase in the levy. So our proposed budget and revenue is summarized up above. We have revenue projected with the hold harmless restored. The foundation aid um, formula based on the governor's projections shows a reduction in our foundation aid of $372,000. We anticipate that this will be restored. We don't expect any increase. They talk, have talked about an increase, but right now I've just put in the hold harmless to be conservative. Um, and with no increase to the tax levy, our revenues total a little over $89.5 million. And this is a 1.5 overall increase in the total revenue. Our budget projection is at $93,045,000, and that's a 4.1% increase in the overall budget. Last year, our total budget increase was a 6.5% or 6.3% increase, just for numbers. This number includes the capital transfer, which is a little over $1.1 million. And so that gives us a total budget gap of $3.5 million. This does not include any appropriated fund balance. We have appropriated historically $900,000 in fund balance over quite a few years. There was one year that we appropriated $1,250,000. I believe that was in 22-23. If we were to include the 3% increase that they're talking about, um, that would give us $636,971 total increase. That's including the whole harmless. So the difference between the two is a little bit under $350,000 more if we were to get that increase. But it is most likely that we are not. Turn it over to Dr. Coates for the major increases and decreases. So I just want to pause before we go back to the slides for a moment um, to talk about what we know with the state as of uh, this current moment. Sunday night, the state legislature with the governor actually passed another extender bill. So what we know is we don't have a budget from the state yet. So the hypotheticals that we're talking about are exactly that. We have no confirmation of the hold harmless being restored. Our conversation with our state legislature, state legislators, forgive me, has indicated that's where the high prob probability lands. The potential of getting the 3%, 2%, even 1% really has not been any part of the conversation that I have heard from any of our state legislators, which is why what you're going to see tonight is really predicated on just knowing that the hold harmless would likely be restored. Part of the other conversation that evolved over the weekend was the impact of the inflation formula also that's built into the state budget right now. The governor has started to push, if you will, that perhaps we want to revisit that, which drew the ire of many of the legislators, because if that happens, it's going to push more school districts into hold harmless, reducing some of the proposed aid that actually came out in her first proposal from January. Why do I bring all this up? My assumption is we will not have an approved state budget. This is, and let me be very clear, we will not have an approved budget before you have to approve the budget to present to our local public. Okay, That is very much my assumption. So that happening means that anything that comes after, so the state approves its budget in the middle of May and we're just about to vote, either we're going to have to fill the hole that they may have made or anything that's surplus, we can then decide where to distribute in the budget. 
Nevertheless, we have a legal obligation to have you approve a budget to present to the public in a timely fashion, which is why you have to approve the budget on April 22nd. Going back to the presentation here, just talking about some of the drivers in this year's budget. If you look at the 24-25 increases in terms of staffing, so typically we have um, up to, if you will, about five CPSE students coming in. We actually 12 as of today entering into the elementary school, which is going to precipitate the need for some new staffing. As per other conversations, we knew the value of having the behaviorist in district this year. We know that our uh, grant funds are going to sunset, so we have actually included the behaviorist as part of some of the proactive pieces that we wanted to see to try to address needs of students with disabilities. The second year of the BOCES Capital Improvement Project is going to come online, so that debt service will come on. That's a, a you have to look at it as a double edge because while we have to pay out the debt because it's BOCES, we will draw the aid uh, in the same year or the subsequent year. Mm -hmm. It's the following year because BOCES actually went out to borrow, so we will draw that aid. So we have, do have to pay that off. We do have increased retirement costs. Um, we know in the first year, based on some of our collective bargaining agreements, there are some retirement costs that we are subject to. So any of the breaches that we may see from any of our retirements don't typically come until the second year when we start to see the lower salaries. In relation to many of our incoming students, we're starting to see growing need for students to be placed outside of districts for BOCES. We're watching our legal fees and we're watching our contract salaries very quickly very closely rather. On the other side of what we are seeing in terms of decreases, we will see some of the breakage in the long term. Again, it won't come this year, and we have no assumed attrition in the budget this year. So based on the stability and enrollment, when you look at our enrollment where we are this year compared to where we were last year, we're actually up about 30 to 40 students right now. So we did not forecast taking any staff out of the budget. As we've discussed, we completed a transportation audit. That transportation audit has indicated that we can potentially reduce some of our inventory. So we took our bus purchases out already. That's approximately $760,000. In this year's budget, we also had an E-rate project to the tune of about $414,000. While we will draw aid on that, we again had to take the expenditure out. That was to replace and upgrade our Wi-Fi. We were able to re uh, reclaim some money there. We uh, have taken out some added district placements uh, to balance out some of the new ones, but again, we're a little higher on the ad side than we are on the decrease side. Some of our BOCES transportation costs, we have been trying and will continue to try based on the number of drivers that we can hire to reclaim some of those runs that go out of district that have been through the BOCES COSER. BOCES had to rebid that COSER uh, through transportation and the increases, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was astronomical. So we have been looking at ways to try to get some of those back in district as well. And again, uh, some of the transfers to special aid, we're trying to really neaten up and look for ways to ensure that, again, we're saving as much money as we possibly can. So as was requested by the board on the next slide, we have prepared for you what the different scenarios look like. So we've uh, prompted a 0% on the tax levy, a 1%, a 2%, and then a 2.9%. If you want to set a benchmark, each 1% on the tax levy is approximately $545,000 in revenue for the school district. While I know it is very difficult, the only we need to keep in mind that the only way for the district to draw revenue is either through any interest earnings that we have to be very careful of because we're seeing the market change very quickly or to look to uh, increase taxes. The other piece that we have to be very mindful of also is where we set the tax levy for this year has bearing for what the tax cap projection could be in subsequent years that Ms. Lamarin is going to go over in a couple of minutes. The other piece is too different scenarios to be able to balance the budget based on keeping the tax base low is going to require us to dip into reserves. It's going to require us to potentially pull out our transfer to capital using uh, different ways to uh, address our facilities concerns. 
And we need to be mindful of our ability to continue to draw from those reserves and fund balance if we start to use it up front. Because the more that you use now, the less that you're going to have moving forward. So we have put these projections in for you and different options on how uh, we could potentially, ba potentially balance the budget using the different uh, scenarios between appropriated fund balance and capital transfer. I do want to just stress those concerns that we have regarding future tax levy considerations. Going too low could potentially put us in a negative tax gap for the next year. That, appro that appropriated fund balance concern that we have, again, if you set that too high, you have to be able to draw that money in subsequent years to be able to balance your budget. And if we're spending it, we're not going to have it. We're only going to be forced to only pull from our reserves. A negative tax cut, tax cut indicates a funding cliff. We have to be ever so careful of that. And again, forcing us to pull out our transfer to capital monies is also in the future going to force us into borrowing again to be able to address any uh, building projects that we need to do in the future. So to talk about what the specifics of that look like in real numbers, I'm going to turn it back to Ms. Lamran to walk you through the tax levy, the facts and the figures, and what it looks like in terms of the different scenarios that we just present. I'm trying to walk through this slowly, but if you have a question, please let me know before the lunch is so this is the um, fact, facts and figures. I have the historical data up here from 2019-20 through to the current year of 23-24. We have the tax levy cap change in the percentage change, the tax levy itself, the percentage change each year. I have the tax levy at the cap, what that dollar figure comes to, and the tax levy, what you actually or the prior boards have voted on and approved as a tax levy in the past. And the difference, this is the difference between what the tax levy cap dollar figure is and what the tax levy actually is. And then last but not least, we've accumulate, accumulated the difference in this and the aggregate total um, as of 2324 is $3.3 million, or a little bit over $3.3 million. In the 24-25 school year, I have that in italics so that you know that this is a projected amount. I've projected this with the 2.9% tax levy increase, and that would give us an additional amount of revenue of $1,581,832. I also did some projections on the taxes for a $400,000 home, based on the three scenarios, 1%, 2%, and 2.9%. This is based upon our current equalization rates and assessed values. Those typically will change between now and August. Um, even June, those numbers can change. It depends on when the towns decide on the formal rate or the final rates for the equalization rate and the assessors as well. Is there any questions on this slide? I have a question, actually. Sorry. So I know in the past, in talking about uh, the budget, sorry, I should park this up. Um, we talked about how the various fund, uh, different fundings we received because of COVID. A lot of those are coming to an end, correct? Is, is that all of them? Yeah. So is that why we see so little increase over the last two years? Because we were receiving additional funding? And so no. So, so if you remember, um, there was in 2007, the lawsuit came, well, it didn't come in 2007, but they started to play, if you will, with the foundation aid formula that was under Gov Governor Patterson at the time. Mm -hmm. Schools were only funded under the current law at that time at approximately anywhere from 50 to 60% of the foundation aid formula the way that it's drafted. There was a lawsuit that went against then Governor Cuomo to address how we're going to reconcile this. Are we going to change the formula and then fund according to the law, or are you going to fund the formula the way it's currently drafted? Governor Hochul came in because Governor Cuomo left office and said, the way I choose to resolve this is I'm going to fund the formula the way that it's drafted. They couldn't do it all in one year, so they chose to do that over three years. Now that we've reached that three year period, I think the state's starting to realize maybe we can't fund this the way that it's currently drafted, which is why, number one, we're seeing our foundation aid freeze because essentially we're fully funded. 
but now we're seeing the impetus that perhaps some of this is going to reduce. The grant monies that you're asking about, the way that we funded our summer programs, the way that we've hired many of these AIS teachers for a short period of time, the way that we've been able to do some things with special education and AIS, that will all come to an end. And especially going 25, 26, much of that will have to be removed. Thank you. So just to kind of go off of John's question, for those positions, and and I don't need that right now because I don't want to put you on the spot, but I guess my question would be, how many of those positions were put into effect? And at that time, we, we knew that this funding was coming to an end. So what was a long range plan for those positions as far as stability and, you know, and just kind of, or was it, we're looking at, we're just going to ask for a 3%. So basically what was it kind of the plan? So maybe, maybe we could get um, a breakdown on what those positions were, how many were put into place. I know that we use some of those funds for other things as well, uh, just to kind of understand. Where... I can give you exact figures. Oh, now. So when those positions were hired, we hired both an ELA and math AAS specialist at every building. When they were hired, even the way the posting was done, the posting was listed at a, as a grant funded position. And every person that was hired was told specifically, this is a two year position to address learning loss and learning gaps that we have seen during the pandemic. It was made very clear, I shared it with the principals, I shared it with the staff members. Eight staff members across the district. That is to the tune of about between $725,000 and $750,000 in salary and benefits. Because it's ending this year, again, some of it's included in the budget because some of that grant funding will end at mid-year of the, the fiscal year moving into the next year, all of that will have to be removed for next year. Got it. And only because we talked about it a little bit on a previous slide. I know that, and I understand we need it, some of the special ed positions, are any of those positions going to be put into the 611 or 619 grants, or are those strictly budget-funded positions? Do you want to talk about where they are? So those are budget-funded because we've maxed our 611 and 619, 619 grants with staff currently on, on books. So. We, we don't have any movement right now to put any additional staff in those grants. I don't know what the exact numbers will be yet. That doesn't come out until like June, mm -hmm. but I don't anticipate those going up too much. Okay, and those are simply budgeted. So in, in the spreadsheets you shared, mm -hmm. those people are budgeted underneath those 611, 619, the ones who are already budgeted and will be for next year. We just don't have room to add additional ones, correct? Okay. I just had a follow-up question. So on page five, when we talk about the budget major changes, increases and decreases, do we have a number of that either positive or negative? But what's the delta? Does that show us a net gain or a loss of um, those changes? So I don't have that number off the top of my head. I would have to run those numbers, but it is a net loss because the breakage and the retirement costs are pretty much a net zero. And we've added staff, and we've added um, the behaviorist, uh, the debt service for the BOCES uh, capital project, the BOCES placements, legal fees, and contract salaries that's, uh, throughout the district. Uh, for the breakage, there really hasn't been as much as compared to the increases, but I could get that number for you if you, if you would like that. Um, just as a total net change. Benefits also have gone up, and I didn't list that really because they go up every year. Typically, they go up. So, to follow up to Scott's question. Um, you talked about how the retirement, the breakage, we don't really see a savings in year one. It's off in year two. Will we be able to get an idea of what the, you know, the perspective, you know, the future would savings would be? Just because we talk about what scares me is the, you know, uh, the, the tax cap 
in future years. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to know if you know if we're coming into a surplus next year. You know, maybe that. Uh, so, can I hop in on that for one? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. So, so one of the things that we need to be mindful of, and we can give you an approximation when you look at the retirees going out. And we've tried to speak about this very specifically in the budget, and this is not casting dispersions; it's just a reality. There were days where you could hire every teacher at step one or two. Sure. You cannot hire a math teacher or a science teacher right now at step one or two, even the newest teacher. So we budgeted a little bit higher in the budget. Makes sense. Humanities teachers, elementary teachers, yes. I, and I've, I'll be transparent, I've already spoken with the principals. This is the year where you're gonna have to go out and get the best and the brightest of the newest crop. Let's not go out and look for the 15-year the teacher that wants to, to transfer to a new district because we're gonna to have to be really prudent with our budget this year. So while we can give you some of those numbers, it's an approximation until the hiring is actually done. Understood, thank you. I guess the, my, my thought is when you went over the you know, kind of the 1, 2, 2.9, mm -hmm. we're pulling a bunch of money out and those other options from our funds balance. So my thought was if you know if we landed the surplus, maybe some of that money could go back to the funds balance in future years. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And because you don't want to have over four percent, anything over four percent, we'd like to put in reserves for our rating day funds for if we do see a decrease in aid next year, which there's a good possibility, so we're changing the funding formula, then that helps us to better prepare for increases in the budget. Our reserve funds, I went over those um, kind of back in January or February, and we do have TRS reserves and ERS reserves. That's the employee retirement system reserves, which are very helpful when you have an increase. And then I know we could, um, we had an increase of over 2% in the ERS rate, so we were actually able to include that as an exclusion in the tax levy cap. So that indicates to me that there's a good possibility that those rates will continue to increase. Okay. Right, so here we have the first slide with the projected tax levy cap of zero. And um, that would give us the same tax levy as 23-24 and a 0% increase. And then what happens in 25-26, it actually drives the tax levy cap to go down into the negative 3.9%. That is a total of $55.3 million, which is still more than a 0% levy increase, which is $54,580, um, but it does decline. So once it starts to decline, it takes time to work back up again. Does that make sense? So projecting into 26-27, there's a 1.9% increase. $56.4 million, and then if we stay at zero, it's still $54.5 million. Um, and again, the governor has talked about changing the funding formula, so you could see a decrease in our aid next year, so that negative could really impact us if we wanted to go above a 0% level. And there is the 1% increase. And again, these are all projections based on current numbers right now with the tax levy cap. That would be the growth factor and the CPI all the same. Those do change. They do not change by a large number. So it is safe to use those for, your, for our projections. Um, and 25, 26, if we were to increase the levy in 24, 25 by 1%, there's a decrease of 2.9% in the levy cap. And again, our tax levy at the cap would go down from 57 million to 55.9 million. Our tax levy increase would be to 55 million, 677 in 25, 26. For 24, 25, 1% increase in the levy is $545,804. Our, um, in order to bridge the gap, we would have to make significant reductions in expenses. And the, I don't know, I don't want to say the best way, but the fastest way to make up significant reductions is through salary and benefits. When I presented the budget to you, you can see that salary and benefits make up 80% of the total budget. 
between 76 to 80 percent of the budget. So in order to make reductions, that only is the quickest way to reduce the budget. Um, our gap with a 1% increase in the levy is $2.9 million. And that's including the reduction to capital. So if I were to reduce capital by 1.1 million and raise taxes 1%, we would have a gap of $2.9 million. Now can, can we have a projection of 2% in the tax levy for 24-25? And our projected levy cap change Still negative, it's 1.9%, but as you can see, it's been going down, and that's because we've been going up to the tax levy scenarios. We started at zero, we went to one, now we're at two. We do still have a reduction in the levy cap between 57 million to 56 million. We can increase our levy 1.5%, and the reason for that is because 1.5% is still less. That, well, it's just at, I'm sorry, the number of the tax levy cap, $56,483,214. So um, we would, if you had plans in hopes to increase it 2% or more in the following year in 2526, you couldn't, the max we could go out here is 1.5%. And that would be, if we were to, Increase taxes 2%, that gives us $1,091,608 in our revenue increase, and our gap would still be $2.4 million. And then in 26-27, we go back up again, and the levy cap increase is 3.4%, but this is based on a 2% cap increase, or I'm sorry, 2% levy increase, so that's what the final line number there is for 2%, or $57.6 million. Any questions on that? So, just have a question as far as when you're, when you're working with the tax cap formula, and, and I don't know this, for BOCES, knowing that we are going to be acquiring debt for BOCES, mm -hmm. obviously we can raise our tax cap based upon that amount of debt that we can put in. So, I don't recall if BOCES has given us a schedule of they have yeah so is it safe to say that when you've put all these numbers in for the future years you've increased the BOCES debt as well I so have. it's okay yeah I've, I've increased that and I've also um, projected our budget or our building aid for the next five years as well because that does impact the tax levy cap too I've also um, projected our pilot payments because they're also part of the calculation in the tax levy cap because we do have some going off next year, maybe it's the following year, and some coming on, depending on if they're getting closer to go on. This year we were supposed to have one of the pilots come on, no, it was, it was Kadeem, and they are not close to being ready to be assessed. So that's going to set our pilots back, uh, according to the assessor, about two years. So that's all part of this formula and uh, putting all of this together is <laughs> many spreadsheets. So <laughs> but, uh, yeah, thank you for asking. That's a good question. So in, uh, last but not least, we have projected the tax levy at 2.9%. And here you will see the uh, levy cap change in 25-26 is a negative 1%. So you've watched that go down. Even though it's still negative, but you can see the impact that changing the amount you levy changes the amount you can levy in the levy cap calculation. 2.9% uh, levy increase equates to $1,581,832 more in revenue, and we will still be experiencing a gap of $1,925,213 which I can bring you back to that. That's actually in one of the beginning slides, if you want to look at that. And you can see these differences are reflected. Um, find my number. Um, page six. There we'll 
see those numbers. The second line from the bottom are the gaps. I'm sorry, the third line from the bottom are the gaps that I've been discussing as we've presented the 1%, 2%, and 2.9% tax levy. And then the options, um, obviously, we should not appropriate fund balance of $2.3 million. That would have to be a combination of reserves and fund balance because we don't have that much. I mean, if you wanted to go below 4% and fund balance, it's an option, but it, it's not a recommended option at all. Um, same thing for the 1%, so 0, 1%, and 2% all require more fund balance to be appropriated and the removal of the capital transfer from the budget side in order to balance the budget. And then this slide kind of summarizes what I just went over on the different scenarios, so I thought it would be good to go back to here so you can see this. Does anybody have any further questions? It's a lot to take in. <laughs> a lot of numbers, options, not as many as I wish. And just to let you know, I, I just had to run the amount of money that we would need to bridge this gap and keep the capital transfer in the budget, appropriate 900000 as we have in the past, would equate to a 4.8% increase in the levy. And I know that's a question, but just so you know what kind of amount we're talking about in order to balance the budget. That's how much it would come to. And that's the 3.5 million. Let's see if I can sneak in. So as we're going to uh, be required at the next meeting to adopt the budget, uh, we are going to seek direction from the board on where you would like us to head in terms of preparation. We are anticipating, obviously, some last minute changes in terms of personnel. Goal is to try to preserve as much of the capital transfer money as we can. We know that that's been very positive for us to be able to address our facilities. We will preserve personnel at all costs in this budget to try to make sure that our classrooms and our facilities are well staffed. But we do need some direction from the board in terms of what you would like prepared for the next meeting, because you will be asked. Obviously, we will have time to deliberate, and we can bring multiple scenarios again. But you will be asked at the next meeting to adopt a budget to hit our required timelines to prepare the budget vote for the public in May. I just have one other question um, regarding. Uh, I did go through um, briefly the spreadsheets that you sent out, and I noticed. The security, um, obviously we want security, we want to make sure we have the best security. Last year when we looked to go out for security, I know that BOCES was the quickest, easiest um, as far as getting that set up. Uh, I know that we're not getting aid on it because you can't get that in New York State, but is there, were there any conversations as far as going out for an RFP or for, I'm using security as an example, but for anything that we're currently utilizing uh, as far as just extensions on any of our, our programs that we're looking to save some money. So in relation to security, obviously we'd have to go back and look at the contracts that we just signed because we're only one year in. We'd have to look back at the RFP what the uh, parameters of that were and, and not having looked at it, I don't want to misspeak to that. There's always options to look at that. I think we're up against the timeline right now to be honest with you. you know, we're. 30 days out from, or just a little bit more than 30 days out from a budget vote. I don't know it would be plausible to do any of that before. We could roll the dice on some of it to see what it might bear for us during the fiscal year, but I don't think we could do anything before the budget vote. Just curious. Sure. Mm -hmm. I know you, uh, you outlined you know, the, the three new FTEs. Were there any changes in the budget? We've heard a lot from the community regarding the art program. So one of the pieces that we spoke about last time, and it is still preserved in this budget, is we do have the option to add additional sections. That is still in the budget, and I could work very closely with the building administrator if the budget is approved with that in it and passes for him to work over the summer to add those potential additional sections for the art program. Thank you.
We'll take our seat, but again, the only thing that we're looking for is direction for next week on what you would want in terms of preparation, because again, you will be asked at the next meeting to adopt a version of the budget. Just one more question. Oh. So no matter what we increase the tax levy, based on this chart here on page six, we're going to be closing the gap with the capital transfer and the fund balance. So am I to assume then that there'll be no cuts would be made no matter what percentage we, we picked? So, so if I misspeak, tell me. So we will need to use any combination of appropriated fund balance, the current money that isn't transferred to capital for facilities. The goal is not to try to touch our reserves. But that being said, if something is approved, there are no reductions in terms of staffing that are being proposed within this budget. And that transfer was 1.1? It, it was just short of 1.2. One one ninety, I think. Yeah, one million one hundred ninety thousand. Yeah, we just bumped it up a little bit last year because of the uh, the increase. We're, and we're trying. We're we're looking to try to preserve as much of that because we have gotten some really good work done in the buildings with that. But I hate to say it. Staff staff comes first. I think when I look at this, if we look at the historical tax levy page, I guess page three maybe, just you know, going through this chart and looking at the historical changes, if we look at every time there was a, what's called an out of cycle low change, it directly resulted within two or three years, an out of cycle very high change. So if, if I look at, you know, in 2014 it was 1.85. In 2016, 7.44. Mm -hmm. But I guess my question, I wrote that I'm just gonna ask it. Was that was that the bond? The yeah, that service came on the books gotcha. for the big project. Okay. Yeah, it was a, uh, but so how about in like if I look at 2018, it's 1.69, and then a couple of years later it's 3.52. Um, I guess, and and this is not speaking from the point of extreme knowledge here. So this is more of a question than anything else, but. I guess my fear is looking at these numbers. If we weren't to go on the higher side, what's what's to come later on is is even scarier. I know the seven point four four is the outlier, and that was the bottom. I understand enough of that, but I, you know. I, so, and I don't want to oversimplify it. The reality is, is you either have to look to increase your revenue, or you have to make significant cuts on the expense side. Yeah. We have been very careful about making sure that, like I said, with your staffing, um, we've looked very careful into the outlier years. We talked about the AAS positions. We've made very clear to those employees and the principals, those were for a specific, specific purpose and temporary. That is a proposed decrease for the 25 26 year. If we go any further, we're going to have to look for other expense cuts. Yeah, I guess that's, you know, as a firm believer that. You know, education is more than the classroom, and as a parent of a child who takes part in a ton of extracurricular activities, we struggle with that one. Um, I guess that's what scares me. If I'm being honest, is you know any any level of cut, you know, jeopardizes those things. I don't think it's a secret that I'm going to play that's sports. What, that's also why I provided to the board the the breakdown sheets. If you look, there, there's really not a lot left there besides salary and benefits to reduce. There's just not a lot left in the budget. And it, it's not just the extracurriculars, because we keep asking about things like the art program mm -hmm. and the addition of things like important things like Orton Gillingham and looking at our special education programs and, and increasing all of those. And we see things that, are, that we want to see comes to any of that. Yeah. yeah. And that, you know, we, we preserved, I think, about $35,000 in training for things like that. Mm -hmm. That would be another area we would have to cut, but thirty-five thousand dollars is a far cry to get to one percent, which we still have five hundred and forty thousand dollars. Sure, you know it's, a, it's, a, it's obviously a, a tough balance, as you know, often thrown around with trustees of the community, right? And the uh, I think when we're when we're all going through the election cycle, the number one thing is, hey, I don't want my taxes to go up. That's everybody says in chest, and I understand that. But when we come to these meetings, and you know, tonight's a little light on attendance, but usually they're pretty full. And they're full of people who say, I, I, I want additional services, I want additional programs, I want additional sports teams, I want additional, additional, additional. Looking at the last couple of years of 001, there's not a lot of additional, you know. So. 
the other thing you have to remember is the transfer cap that we've been using for roofs and the high school still needs to be done. We still have active. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, that, our buildings are all another expense. <laughs> you know, everything to change a light bulb in the middle school costs a couple hundred thousand dollars. So, you know, it's, uh, there's the, the buildings are old. I don't, I don't see the repair work going down. Either. So, well, I appreciate staff because Kitty and I totally respect that. I don't. I don't think our, our other the other twenty percent of that budget is going to get any smaller. So I was just going to add to that. I think a lot of really good points have been made here. So you can know, to the point about thirty five thousand tying in with you had said also Billy was you know that's just one example of an item where thirty five here, thirty five there, forty five there you could really start adding up because I think no matter how you cut it, even if you said, oh yeah, 2.9, we love that idea, and it, 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 it applies, you still have the gap. Mm -hmm. So I think no matter where we land here, we really have to start looking at that. And I think we have to take charge of all of those areas where we really can and, and start scrutinizing it a little bit more to find those areas where we can tighten up. Because I think just as forward everyone said, the last thing I'd want to see touch would be salaries and benefits with all the desire to have more provided <clears throat> but even if it is 35 here and there and there and there and you find 10 instances of that and now sure. you take a small amount out of your reserve and we're splitting the difference so, so I think we're really in that position we have to look at that stuff rather tight Ms. Leonard, do you have any more items we kind of crossed over um, there? Agenda yeah. items. Just have the financial report for the month of May. Okay, great. Dr. Coach, are you, you done with yours? So I, I just want to make sure that I'm clear. I, I, we do need <coughs> direction from the board on, on what you want prepared for next week. Because that, that will be the date at which you, you will be required to adopt a budget. So again, we're happy to have multiple scenarios ready that we can have the resolutions prepared different ways. But we just have that clarity what what is the board's direction. We build the conversation we had so far here, just my initial two cents on that is I wouldn't like to go two point nine. I wouldn't like to jump all the way there. See the community come out of zero zero one. I'd be a little more comfortable with two. $500,000 delta in terms of the, the gap in the following year. Just kind of my initial thought instead of jumping all the way up there. You know, any other thoughts on initial things? I mean, my initial thought was that 2.9 comes out a little bit high. I kind of like the 2% number. If you look at the amount of money coming from the fund balance, it's only 300000 more. When you look at some of the other numbers on the charts, again, you're off, but not by much. And by doing that, you save the taxpayers about $100. When you go from a 2.9 down to 2, from 270, basically to 180. So you're saving everyone $110. You're still getting a good amount of money. You're still funding things. And I don't think you have to cut from the programs. And I think you still can probably have things in the budget to do things like the RFA. That was my two cents. I honestly don't see how we could go below two percent. But um, I'm sure I'm sure there's probably a lot of answers on how we can. But uh, it's just you know, I think we have to look at these increases as cumulative. And as I think I brought up last time, you know, the two years of zero, what do you get? So right now, if you went back and did 0.5 each time, you'd be happy with two percent this time, right? So it's you know. I feel like anytime there's a zero increase, we're kind of kicking the can down the road. And I think if, we're, if the penance for doing that is a 2% increase, I think that seems pretty fair. Um, I agree with, with what John was saying. I think it has to, it has to be at, at 2%. I mean, I don't think there's any way we can obviously do a zero or one. Um, mm -hmm. it's just, it's, it might be too drastic to go to the 2.9. 
safer answer. Um, I just I don't want to see the cuts. I think there's a credit to, you know, obviously this first year on the board, but a credit to the people who have been here and who are here before me. We've made a lot of great improved facility improvements, and I feel like we've, you know, built momentum in that arena, and I would hate to see it for that to stop. Um, I think we, we've all learned through this process, and I've learned very quickly, that the more we put them off, the more expensive they are when it comes time to fix them. So I think, that, I think we have a healthy appetite for that right now, and I'd like to see that continue. And, and we're clearly seeing that having our building condition survey completed and having scrutinized that with you know the feedback from the director of facilities here and each of these meetings, the real need to continue to improve the facilities. You know, you mentioned the roofs. The water gets in, the, the cost becomes exponential. So I think being cautious of that as well to not deplete too much of the money that we're transferring in for earmarked building projects, it's important to be consistent. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, I, I agree with what everyone's saying. I mean, I'm not comfortable with 2.9, just given the history of what we've been doing. And just because things are expensive for people overall right now, it's a very expensive time to live. Um, you know, back to 0% reset or 0% increase, there was so much unknown during COVID of what was going to happen. So it was like, we don't need to raise it. Why would we do that? No, no one knew what was going to happen in the next year. Um, you know, I, I am comfortable with 2%. I think, though, that there's some great points that have been made that, you know, we all, we all have the same goal, right? We all think that the kids in this community deserve everything that we can possibly give them, and that's our goal. I think it's also a good thing to look at what we've been spending our money on because times change and what we value and what we want to invest in can shift. So I think it's good to look at you know where we put that money and see where we can save. Because I agree, thirty-five thousand here, you know, ten thousand here, fifty thousand here, it all adds up, and that that does become a salary eventually, and that does become bigger things. So my long-winded answer is I, I am comfortable with. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I'm just going to repeat what everyone said. I'm just listening to both sides and thinking to myself, it's obviously any increase in taxes is difficult, but we have a lot of challenging costs ahead just besides that. So they're not going to go away. I think 2% is obvious. Uh, don't want to say 2.9, but I, but I, I think that, that 2.5 would try to bridge the gap a little bit in the middle and try to find a spot that everyone can be a little comfortable with. Not that any of it is great, but. A lot of it's out of our control. Any other thoughts anybody wants to share? You, you had said 2.5. Do we want to see a breakdown on 2.5? See what that looks like? Uh, and that's what you said, phone the line. Maybe, maybe look at both, go in the middle to 2.5 and narrow it down to. See what that looks like. See what the numbers look like. Listen, I'm, I'm obviously comfortable with two. Just to see the point five. I think to echo Shannon's point, like I do want to be aware of you know be sensitive to culture shock. You know, our our increases have been so minimal. And while uh, I don't think it's any secret, I'm, I'm a pretty strong proponent of the increase. Um, given that I believe the, you know, our funding so opportunities for our kids is probably the most important thing we're doing here. I do think two percent kind of falls in line with. With what's, what's fair. Um, and that I think that it, it doesn't hinder us so much in the, in the future tax kind of levy. Um, you know, that, that's why you know, it's, it, I, don't, I don't say 2%, anything below 2% is impossible because I've been crunching the numbers for weeks. I just look at the future tax kind of levy and I don't want to, I don't want to be making very difficult decisions next year based off of. I think one that's a lot easier this year. Okay, so give you some hypotheticals for now. Okay. Pro approximates, if you will. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's great. So if you were to go to 2.5%, sorry, thank you. 2.5%, <laughs> the 5% in addition to the 2% equals $272,902 more. 
is where the two percent is. So we would still fall under the negative 1.9 percent and stay within the 1.5 percent increase for the following year, but we would be that much higher with our starting point. So that we could increase the 2526 number also by close to $273,000. So, in short, it's additional revenue of $273,000. Be thinking in terms of staff, two teachers and a teacher assistant for benefits, roughly. I mean, I'm comfortable with the 2% at that point. It looks like there's more of a majority looking at it. Some of you are smarter than me on, on the money side, so, and have some knowledge about school districts, so. I'm comfortable with going out with 2%. Okay. Any other questions? Very good. Then, we're not super thankful. Anything else? That's it for tonight. Thank you, Zen. All right, thanks, Dr. Coates. All right, and then, um, you got it? Get that right? Just a summary of the March uh, financial reports in the board packet for tonight. Our expenses in the general fund totaled $7.8 million. We received a lot of state aid in, which is typical in the month of March. That's when the fiscal year ends for New York State. We received $7.4 million in general aid. Our lottery aid payment was $144,000. Excess cost aid was $1.6 million. We also received our tax returns from the county. That's the unpaid amounts that we turn in in November. And that comes to $2.4 million. And our interest earnings were just under $150,000. Our total expenses through the end of March were $55.5 million, which is 62% of our total budget. And when I compare that to where we were last year at this time, we were at 63% being total spent out of the budget. Revenue status, we've earned $79.4 million in revenue through March 31st, or 90%. Last year at this time, it was 92%. So we're just a little under, and I, I don't see where the big difference is coming from, to be honest with you, because our interest income is up the same as last year, and our state aid is as well. So it's just a slight 2% difference, but nothing to believe about. Any questions? Very much. Moving on to our next point, our assistant superintendent for curriculum, instruction, personnel, and technology report, Mr. Jason Carter. Thank you, Mr. Loftus. Good evening, everyone. Just a couple of brief updates for you. Then I'll celebrate some student achievements and talk about um, some upcoming events, if you will. Uh, so recently, ADAC of Orange County held their 37th annual poster competition for substance use substance use prevention. Um, as we always do, we had a great number of participants. This year, we're very fortunate to have 35 students awarded um, a top three finish in that competition and many others with honorable mention. Most notably this year, we do have two of the grand prize winners here uh, in Goshen. So we're very proud of that. Uh, all of the students will be honored at the Paramount Theater. Uh, so those that were honorable mention, top three and the grand prize winners will be uh, recognized in Middletown on May 10th. And then those grand prize winners um, will be recognized by the Orange County Youth Bureau on um, June 5th at SUNY Orange. Um, here in-house, our two grand prize winners are Aub Aubrey Cerigliano in grade six and uh, Kaya Ohm in grade four. So again, very proud of our students for their participation. I also want to thank uh, our, our staff members, our faculty members at the middle school and Goshen Intermediate School for helping our students participate. We'll be supervising all of the posters that were submitted. Um, 
And I'll make special mention, although I don't have the exact number, I know that Mr. Hoover at Goshen Intermediate School, uh, he participates every year. He's a longstanding faculty member. Um, I know Mrs. Turiano, Ms. Turiano is trying to work on um, some submission numbers. I think Mr. Hoover might be approaching some record submission numbers. So I just want to say thank you to him and, and his diligence and hard work um, consistently over the years. And I know that our middle school faculty members have also worked very hard, so we're very proud of that department. As many of you may know, the 3 8 testing window has opened, so today is actually the first day of the now large window for testing. Uh, so we are responsible for administering the ELA, the math, and the new science all in one window. Uh, we can choose those dates, whatever works for us and our students and families, um, but it must be done in two consecutive days, uh, except for the science, which is one. Uh, so here we will begin the ELA test on the 10th, which is Wednesday. And again, that will be two days in a row, the 10th and the 11th. Makeups will follow shortly thereafter. Um, remember, this is a computer-based test, so our students will arrive. Uh, they'll access Chromebooks when the testing window opens, and they will take their test with a limited time. Uh, and again, shortly following the next day, we will start that makeup window. Uh, we'll move into math um, on the 24th and 25th of April. Same format, two consecutive days, makeup starting shortly thereafter. Um, and we're, we're entertaining right now um, the 8th, May 8th, for the grade 5 and the grade 8 computer-based testing for science. So we'll let you know how that goes. We're hoping that our participation rates uh, are high, and we hope our students do very well in a no-stress environment, of course. Uh, I do want to mention that if you are familiar with computer-based testing and that setup, there's a lot of work that goes into um, entering student accommodations, getting everything organized by homeroom, uh, by classroom testing session, and so on. Uh, so our administrative team and our, our teacher leaders did a great job with that. So I want to say thank you to all of them for their hard work. Uh, and off we go, beginning on Wednesday. I also want to mention that uh, we did have a monthly check-in with Scholastic um, for our literacy program, so I joined the administrators uh, this, this afternoon, actually late this morning, uh, for our, our check-in. Uh, and this was a really good check-in because things are going pretty well. We talked about um, the potential for uh, more or less a, a reading competition, which we're really just looking to encourage reading uh, throughout the spring and into the summer months. Uh, so Scholastic is looking to team with us to make that happen through our Digital Literacy Pro. So all the online materials that we have access to, um, we may be able to access that and, and encourage students to read throughout the summer months. Um, and also, just as important, we talked about planning for next year with getting some more coaching sessions online, um, getting some more professional development as needed, because we realize that with recent retirements, we will have some new hires and we'd like them to get caught up to speed as quickly as possible, but also we may have some teachers who uh, may just want a quick polish up with some of the previously offered professional development. So we're in the process of, uh, of working that out, and that was just today. So we'll keep you informed as we move forward. Uh, we look forward to continuing to work with, with Scholastic. Um, today with the Eclipse, we did have a lot of uh, great activities. I know Dr. Coates and I and Ms. Limbrand had a chance to get out into the buildings and. I was at GIS for a short time, um, enjoying Dr. Coates High School. I know that you had mentioned uh, going over to the middle school. So in addition to what you had seen on the website, uh, we did have, you know, let's call it little watch parties uh, on the lawn of GIS. I uh, had a chance to see a board member or two in passing. Um, pretty neat day. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to see it. Wish it would have been a little clearer, but it was pretty neat to see portions of the eclipse. So. I'm hopeful that our students and families had a good day today. Um, those that were in school with us, I hope they enjoyed the day and the activities that were planned. Uh, we look forward to the next one about 20 years down the road. Uh, and that's it for me. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Moving on, I need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Shannon Billy. Be resolved that the Board of Education hereby arranges for the special education programs and services based upon the recommendations made for preschool and school age students with disabilities by the Committee on Preschool Special Education CPSA and Committee on Special Education CSE during the period from February 9, 2024 through and including March 21, 2024, and directs the district to arrange for the provisions of said special education programs and services.
to such preschool and school age students with disabilities as recommended during such time period by the CPSC and CSC. Be it further resolved upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education approves the remainder of the consent agenda as pre presented. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I need a motion to approve policy updates, second reading, renumbering, and renaming, and readoptions. Uh, Scott, be it resolved upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education includes the second reading, renumbering, renaming, and readoptions of the following policies fingerprinting, fingerprinting, clearance of new hires, appointment of support staff, old policy, becoming the new policy including hiring. And the new policy conditional appointment and emergency conditional appointment of student safety. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? I need a motion to approve the minutes. Madam Shannon, Brett. Be a result upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of School, the Board of Education approves the minutes of the March 18, 2024 regular board meeting. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? I need a motion to approve the substitution of attorney of record. I am Dillard. Scott. Be resolved that the Board of Education of the Goshen Central School District hereby authorizes Thomas Drohan Wiseman Tenebro LLP to intervene and or be substituted as attorneys of record, as the case may be, in the following proceedings commenced in the Supreme Court of the State of New York, County of Orange, pursuant to Article 7 of the Real Real Property Tax Law. As opposed to reading all 21 of these, I'd like to say as presented. Be further resolved that the Board President and the School District Attorney be authorized to execute all documents and take all steps necessary in furtherance of this resolution. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? I need a motion to approve appointment of DASA designee and acting principal Janelle Inda and Ashley and John. Be resolved upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the Board of Education appoints Janelle Inda as a DASA designee at Goshen High School. There is no stipend for this position. Be it further resolved in the event that the principal of the high school is not physically present in the high school on one or more days or portions thereof. In the 2023-2024 school year, that Janelle Hendo, 10-month assistant principal, be appointed acting principal for all purposes, including short-term student discipline matters, pursuant to Section 3214 of the New York State Education Act. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? I need a motion to approve the intermediate support agreement with Middletown City School District for Transportation. Ashley Scott, be resolved upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education approves the intermunicipal agreement between the Goshen Central School District and the Middletown City School District, which allows for Goshen Central School District to provide transportation of the Middletown City School District student under provisions of the McKinney-Vento Act, effective March 11, 2024, through June 30, 2024. Be it further resolved, the Board of Education authorizes the Board President to execute said, uh, said intermunicipal agreement. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I need a motion to approve the overnight trip for traffic and relays. I'm Billy Shannon. Be it resolved upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education approves the overnight trip for the girls and boys track teams to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. On April 24th through 25th, 2024, and April 26th through 27th, 2024, to participate in the Penn Relays at the University of Pennsylvania. Be it further resolved that the board reserves the right to cancel or reschedule any school sponsored trip or activity in the event of any emergency condition outside of the control of the school district in its sole discretion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I need a motion to accept donations from Brian Mitchell and Goshen Baseball Parents Association. I have Brett and Ashley. Be resolved, the Board of Education does hereby accept with appreciation the donation of two concrete slab bench foundations by Brian Mitchell, owner of Landscape Impressions, in conjunction with the Goshen Baseball Parents Association, for use by the Goshen Central School District Athletic Club. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I'm assuming no additional proof of force. All right, very good. 
any board member issues or comments that anyone would like to bring up? I have one. Um, I'm just curious to find out if on our agenda, if we can split up the consent agenda into two parts. We have the first one, the CSC meetings, then we have the second one with all the other recommendations for the consent agenda. And I just wonder if those could be two separate entities to vote on. I don't know the reason why we can't, and I have no objection to it. Not to make you talk more. <laughs> as long as I can say as presented. Everyone's okay with that? Yeah, sure. Right. Sounds good to me. Um, thank John for the update from Oxfa and um, the legislative update and the information about um, mental health ser services throughout Orange County. Um, I know I utilize a lot of the um, providers, and I am sure that other people on the board also have the opportunity, and it's um, a really useful tool. So it is um, provided around the school. I think it would be great for our um, community. So thank you. Great. I just had one small item I was thinking about. Um, we have so many things going on and so many items moving in different directions. I, I think we try very hard to follow up, but maybe between our team and the admin team here, maybe we can create maybe a digital place for follow-ups. I mean, we all have our notebooks and I try to keep notes. But I think it might be helpful, you know, we've had a variety of different audits going on. Some have been completed, some haven't happened yet. Um, we had a nice update to the Code of Conduct as another example for the district and building levels, Code of Conducts are still rolling out, going to the end of the year. I think maybe if we had a little bit of a, maybe a digital platform, one, it would help us follow up on those items and if appropriate, maybe offer any type of update during some of these meetings as to where we might stand with something that the community's heard about few weeks prior just to give feedback as necessary. So just just a thought, maybe something we could work on together and find an appropriate format. I agree. A living document that continues so we don't have all different sheets. Maybe a spreadsheet, see Google Doc we saw work pretty well with our policies, keep track of them. That way it's a uh, a document that never ends and we can kind of see what's been answered and when we expect to get answers. Okay. Yeah, Google Doc worked well. Any other items? All right, very good. And lastly, I need a motion for executive session. Right. Be resolved. The Board of Education will enter into executive session with the intent not to reconvene the business portion of the meeting for discussions related to employment history of particular persons or persons and negotiations. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? All right, thank you and good night, everybody.